discover a land of dragons, emperors, and ancient dynasties. It's that extraordinary mountainscape. The landscape is extraordinary. The green around it, around the river, is intense. I say, oh my God, you know, I don't think I'm on Earth. Home to the world's highest mountain and some of the longest rivers. No matter the piece that you are at and no matter how it's been reconstructed, you still get to feel the history and the sense of the place. From ancient timbers to modern skyscrapers, a country rich with tradition dating back more than 5,000 years. The dragon on the line is symbolic for the power, strength, to expel the evils. As the world turns its eyes towards China for the 2022 Winter Games, come explore the history and culture. This is Destination China. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm Kaidi Tong. And we're here today in this beautiful Chinese Scholar Garden at New York's Snug Harbor Cultural Center on Staten Island. It's one of only two authentic classical outdoor Chinese gardens in the United States. This one was built by Chinese artisans, everything from the columns and the beams to the tiles and the bridges, all made in China and then shipped here. I also was made in China and came to the States when I was four years old. My mother is a direct descendant of Confucius. We'll talk more about that later in the show. First, let's take a look at some of China's extraordinary history and culture, its breathtaking landscapes, and of course, the food. China is home to 1.4 billion people, the largest population on the planet, but its land mass is really not much bigger than that of the United States. It's located in East Asia along the Pacific Ocean and the borders of 14 countries. A third of China is made up of mountains, including the tallest in the world, Mount Everest, which straddles the border of China and Nepal. You'll also find not hundreds, but thousands of rivers, including the world's third largest, the famous Yangtze River, and the Li River that winds through one of the most picturesque cities, a popular tourist destination called Guilin located in South China. There's a Chinese saying that between the heaven and the mountains and the rivers of Guilin is the best in the world. Yu Sai Khan, often known as the Oprah of China, is a highly successful entrepreneur and philanthropist and one of the first women journalists in China. She is from Guilin. The landscape is extraordinary. So intense that you think that you are in a jade forest. It's so beautiful, that green. And, and I was looking around those mountains. They are so strange in shapes. I say, oh my God, you know, I don't think I'm on earth. Dramatic landforms, limestone cones, and bizarrely shaped hills. It's a place that's inspired countless Chinese poets and artists. And the perfect place to take a leisurely cruise or visit the caves with their majestic stalagmites and stone pillars. Sun Zhan Liao teaches Chinese studies at the China Institute in New York. Li River, while well, started as a canal, uh, actually was man-made and created while really having a long history. The purpose is to connect the south part of China, Lingnan, uh, to Zhongyuan, mostly central, but to northern part of the southern China. Guiling is a two and a half hour flight from Beijing or a day trip by high-speed rail. Of course you've heard of and seen pictures of the Great Wall, but there is nothing like seeing it in person. Without a doubt, this is one of the most spectacular sites in the world. The 13,000 mile wall that zigzags in the mountains of northern China has a long history, stretching back more than 2,000 years. It was built by hand throughout different dynasties in order to protect China's borders from invaders. The wall was a formidable barrier, but wasn't able to keep out the conqueror Genghis Khan. Today, there are no conquerors, but the forces of nature, along with tens of millions of visitors, have eroded portions of the wall. Before the pandemic, more than 10 million people a year visited the Great Wall. It's really a symbol of uh, the Chinese civilization, that it's long, it started from really thousands of years ago, and I would add its continuity. James Heimowitz is president of the China Institute in New York. No matter the piece that you are at and no matter how it's been reconstructed, you still get to feel the history and the sense of the place. One of the best protected sections of the Great Wall is Mu Tianyu. It's also considered one of the best places to see the Great Wall and the most fully restored. 
It is around 45 miles from Beijing's city center. Oh, and by the way, if you're thinking about walking the entire length of the wall, well, it would take about a year and a half, so plan accordingly. Another must-see attraction in the heart of Beijing, the Forbidden City. This was home to the Imperial Palace during the Ming and the Qing dynasties up until the early 1900s. It is the largest palace complex in the world, known now as the Palace Museum. The Forbidden City is something everybody should go see. It's just so iconic and so much a part of, you know, Chinese civilization and sort of what it feels in the DNA to, to be in China. This embodies sort of the whole you know, dynastic experience. Built between 1406 and 1420, the imperial complex has been ravaged by fires and wars and renovated countless times. Most of the architecture you can see today dates from the 1700s on up. This is where the emperor held court and lived uh, in a very ritualized kind of a lifestyle. Um, that's now been captured in a museum that you can actually go in and also when you go in there you can feel and see what it must have felt like to live through those sort of imperial times. The fortress-like design was not only intended to protect the emperor but also to glorify his preeminence. The emperor was, after all, heaven's representative on earth. His palace was built to ensure that neither his subjects nor foreign visitors ever forgot that. The palace complex is surrounded by 33-foot high walls and a 171-foot wide moat. The layout strictly adheres to the principles of feng shui. And if there was any doubt about the size of this complex and its grandeur, well, the Palace Museum contains 9,999 and a half rooms. It's that half room I really want to see. The Summer Palace is now the largest and the most well-preserved imperial garden in China, counted as one of the four famous Chinese imperial gardens. It's just a short 10-mile drive from Beijing city center. This masterpiece of Chinese landscape design includes plants and paths, water and land, architecture, horticulture. The palace was used as a summer retreat by the Chinese royal family. During the hot Beijing months, the imperial family preferred the beautiful gardens and airy pavilions to the walled-in forbidden city. The emperor ordered the construction of the palace in 1750 to celebrate his mother's 60th birthday. It took 14 years to build. Coming up, how digging a well led to one of the most incredible archaeological finds in history, and the important role Confucius plays in China and around the world today, plus the relationship between my family and Confucius. Welcome back to Destination China, I'm Kaidi Tong. A mysterious site awaits you in the city of Xi'an. The terracotta warriors were built, you know, and created over decades so that the emperor would be protected in his afterlife. But it is truly one of the world's, you know, marvels to actually go and look and see the breadth and the scope um, and the intricacy. From Beijing, it's about a four and a half to six hour trip by high speed rail. There you will see thousands of life-size clay soldiers that were buried with the first emperor of the Qing dynasty. All the terracotta soldiers were made to face east, towards the emperor's enemies. These figures were discovered in 1974 by a group of workers who were simply digging a well. And this would turn out to be one of the greatest archaeological finds of modern times. Since then, archaeologists have discovered some 600 pits and a complex of underground vaults across a 22-square-mile area. Perhaps the most recognized Chinese tradition is the Dragon Dance. It originated during the Han Dynasty in 206 BC. You've seen it many times here in the States, performed during the Chinese New Year and believed to scare away evil spirits and bad luck. Chinese New Year's falls during the winter months, but its common name in China is the Spring Festival. Chinese culture and society is a family-based uh, society, as well as many of the traditions are to connect to people. For example, Chinese New Year, uh, it's, it's, of course, it's about uh, families coming together and having food, having meals. And it's also, well, to really connect with the, the ancestors. Every year is symbolized by one of the 12 animals of the Chinese zodiac. 2022 is a year of the tiger. Bing Song is vice chairman of New York's Pacific Asia Travel Association. It's considered the king of the an all the animals. Also gave it the power and uh, strength expel the evils. The Lantern Festival traditionally marks the end of the Chinese New Year's. It falls on the first full moon in the Chinese calendar, marking the return of spring. When I was small, my parents told me 
Why we made lanterns on that day? Because it's believed when you are raising the lanterns in hope to see the gods. The festival can be traced back at least 2,000 years. The story goes that some monks lit lanterns in the temples to show respect to Buddha on the 15th day of the first lunar month. So the emperor ordered that all the temples, households, and royal palaces light lanterns on that evening. By the way, I was born in the year of the Boar. That's spelled B-O-A-R, thank you very much. Of all the great Chinese philosophers, the most famous is Kung Fu Zi, known in the West as Confucius. The main principle of his teachings, which remain influential even today, was kindness. I think the, the most important contribution Confucius made is that he believed the people, he believed the society in which they live in, which is still remains its influence, very strong influence, across in China and the East countries, East Asia countries. The Temple of Confucius and the Cemetery of Confucius, where more than 110,000 of his descendants are buried, and the Kong family mansion in Chufu, Confucius' birthplace, are all very popular destinations for travelers. And here's my story. My mother is a 77th generation direct descendant of Confucius. I was born in Qingdao, in the family complex that is now a tourist attraction called the Confucius Memorial Hall. My grandfather bought the residence when the Germans ended their occupation in the early 1900s. It had been the German consulate. My mother's upbringing in China had been privileged, but she and my father came to the United States with nothing. She was a strong woman and made a good life for me and my brother in America. But she was always troubled that no woman who married out of the Kong family, as she did, could be buried in the cemetery of Confucius. She wanted to be buried there next to her parents. She waged a 20-year-long campaign to change that centuries-old tradition, and she won. Coming up, we take you to the Paris of the Orient, Shanghai, and one of the top ice and snow sculpture festivals in the world, the place that inspired the movie Avatar, and of course, the delicious cuisines of China. Shanghai, or some call it the Paris of the Orient, is the largest city in China with a population of 25 million people. It's a place of contrast where East and West and Old and New converge in magnificent fashion. Shanghai's appeal has always been its glitzy nightlife, but this cosmopolitan metropolis has also become a cultural mecca with plenty of theater, art exhibitions, and concerts. A slice of colonial Shanghai can also be found along the mile-long stretch of waterfront known as the Bund that runs along the Huangpu River. They are beautiful old buildings and uh, they, they're, they're very, very elegant and very, very exceptional. Across the river rises the futuristic skyline, including China's tallest skyscraper, the Shanghai Tower, which stands at more than 2,000 feet, along with the famous Oriental Pearl TV Tower. This global financial center was once the epicenter of Chinese cinema's first golden era in the 1930s. Well, you know, the, the start of Chinese film is in Shanghai. The Shanghai Film Studio is the oldest, or one of the oldest uh, film studios in China, and it's a very productive film studio as well. Of course, both cities have been used extensively as backdrops for American blockbusters like The Last Emperor and Mission Impossible. And of course, you can't talk about Shanghai or really any part of China without talking about the food. You know, one time I asked James Beard, I said, what are the three best cuisines in the world? He says, Chinese, Chinese, Chinese. The hot pot is a simmering staple on the dinner table. Dumplings have been a go-to meal for more than 1,800 years, especially in northern China. Dim sum, which translates literally to touch the heart, originates from Cantonese cuisine. Peking duck is a classic originally prepared for the emperors in Beijing. And Mapu Dofu, an authentic dish from the Sichuan province, known for its spicy food, something Chef Chen knows all about. <laughs> Chef Chen is cooking up a delicious taste of history at his restaurant, Hua Yuan, in New York's Chinatown. I call my food, I would say it's called homestyle. Why? Because I learned my father the way cook. His father began cooking street food in China before becoming a famous chef in the Sichuan province. When my father started, remember, she was called a stand, like a, on the street, we called it like a food stand, like hot dog stand. Another delicious, authentic Sichuan dish, shrimp in spicy ginger sauce. I call my food is to let people satisfy. 
and one of my own favorites, Xiao Long Bao. You know those soup dumplings where you have to take a chopstick and pierce it to get the soup out and then devour it. Okay, I'm hungry now. How about you? The mountain is a Buddha, and the Buddha is a mountain. So goes the famous Chinese saying believed to describe the colossal Buddha as Sichuan. You can certainly see why. Just look up. It is the largest Buddhist sculpture in the world, towering more than 2,000 feet above you. Carved in 713 AD by a Buddhist monk and completed 90 years later, the giant Buddha continues to draw huge numbers of visitors from all across the globe. It is widely regarded as one of China's must-visit attractions that's easily accessible from the city of Chengdu. Next up, Hunan Province. When you first set eyes on Zhang Jiaji National Forest Park, it's really easy to see how filmmaker James Cameron found inspiration for his blockbuster hit, Avatar. One of the tallest pillars standing at an impressive 3,000 feet has actually been renamed Avatar Hallelujah Mountain. Also notable is the Grand Canyon Glass Bridge. Opened in 2016, it's one of the world's highest pedestrian bridges. It's an attraction that's definitely not recommended for the faint of heart. But if you're looking to add a little adventure to your trip, definitely worth it. China made its debut in the Winter Games at Lake Placid in 1980. Since that time, winter sports have become very popular, especially in Harbin, a city so far north it borders Russia and Mongolia. Harbin is known as the Ice City of China, a paradise for winter tourists. It is also home to the International Ice and Snow Sculpture Festival. The Ice Sculpture Festival in Harbin and the Ice Sculpture Festival is one of the most amazing things you can see in the winter. And it's for three months, usually it's about February, December to February. And this is something that you cannot possibly miss. They create it with ice, huge palaces, and things that you just cannot possibly imagine how gorgeous it is. The festival, considered one of the top four in the world, features more than 2,000 ice sculptures, landscapes, ice castles, rides, stage shows. It's a winter fairyland. The top ski resorts in China are also located in Harbin. And for all you adrenaline junkies out there, Yabuli Ski Resort is the biggest. Coming up, we head to Suzhou, an ancient cultural city that attracted artists and scholars and still does today and how the giant panda, once on the endangered list, made a big comeback. Welcome back to Destination China. I'm Kaidi Tong. There's an old Chinese proverb, in heaven there is paradise, on earth there are Hanzhou and Suzhou. Suzhou has long been a haven for scholars and artists, and it still is today. The city is located west of Shanghai, in the center of the Yangtze Delta region, renowned for its classic gardens and traditional waterside architecture. And many say, it's beautiful women. Built in 514 BC, Suzhou was a prosperous city, a favorite summer retreat for emperors. Suzhou is also the hometown of Kun Opera, one of the oldest forms of Chinese opera, blending dramatic literature, soulful singing, and elegant dancing. It became really a center of uh, the culture, especially Chinese culture uh, in southeast China, advanced um, a lot of in terms of literature, in terms of brush painting, in terms of uh, silk making, the art crafts, uh, and also uh, I have to say uh, one of even today um, very important tradition there, for example, not only in the Suzhou Garden, the architecture reflects a lot of Chinese philosophy, uh, the sense of aestheticism, um, and also, for example, the uh, wood print, the wood block print, uh, Nianhua. Uh, that's also quite famous uh, in the area. Suzhou is also a bustling trade center. Suzhou became a center uh, for economic development and later for culture. Um, and it's a, it's a water town. So you go to Suzhou, you really can see this history of thousands of years um, and intertwined with the water that it's right next to um, many lakes and the lake of Tai, Taihu, uh, is one of the, the biggest uh, near Suzhou. Well, I think we can all agree that the cutest symbol of Chinese culture is the panda. These gentle giants live on bamboo and don't hurt other animals. They can climb to 13,000 feet and are very good swimmers. 
One skipped into other countries as a token of goodwill and friendship, they've helped shape China's diplomatic strategies. Perhaps one of the most famous examples of panda diplomacy was in 1972, when China delivered Ling Ling and Xing Xing to Washington, D.C.'s National Zoo after President Richard Nixon's visit to Beijing. Once on the endangered species list, there are now more than 1,800 giant pandas living in the wild, and that's because of China's intensive effort to save these amazing animals. It's really a, a source of pride, uh, and also uh, put in tremendous um, resource. Over the years, there have been a lot of improvement and protection going into the um, preserving and developing the habitat of giant panda. So the more that they can find a uh, comfortable home to thrive, the more that, well, we, we don't worry about uh, the, the disappear one day. And China's unofficial mascot is once again returning for the 2022 games. You look at a panda, you cannot help uh, but fall in love with them. Well, we've come to the end of our journey to just a very few of China's most famous cities and attractions. And now that you know a little bit more about this complex and fascinating country, you may want to make China one of your next travel destinations. So now I say to you, 再见,谢谢你们跟我一块到了中国. Goodbye, and thank you so much for joining me on this little trip to China.